So when I thought about uh, who should um, start us off on a discussion about what we need to do this critical moment um, and the role defense counsel plays in the work we do every day. There was nobody else I could think of besides Lisa Wayne. Um, many of us in this room and many defense counsel across this country look to Lisa as our guide star for how we do our work. Now, I promised her I would not read her full bio, so I won't. But I think Thank after. You. Thank you. Uh, Just means I'm old. No. <laughs> um, but I believe that after she speaks, you're going to agree. So with that, I'm turning it over to Lisa. Thank you. Good morning. Um, and I didn't get mic'd up, so and I move around a lot. So are, is this being taped? Okay, so that makes a difference to me in what I say always, <laughs> and how much I cuss, um, so thank you. Um, and I recognize that this is a mixed group. There are a diverse um, community out here in the criminal legal reform um, effort, but I come to this as a defender and a defender only. So my remarks are based on that. Um, I think that I have a global view of the world, but I'm a defender, and I always will be. So. Um, I come to you and I was so thankful when Tina called me because I agree that this is a moment in time where we are united. Um, we must present a united front. We must lock arms um, together and join forces toward a common goal. One of the interesting things that I have seen in my very brief time as the executive director at NACDL is that we have not always been that way. And it, perhaps it took finally getting warriors of justice to be head of organizations to finally see the right light. Right, April? Right? <laughs> Heather, Lori, I mean, maybe that's what it took. Um, and maybe it will take um, us to finally move the ball. Because one of the things that has struck me and my new policy walk position is that I sit in these rooms. I've been practicing law for 37 years. I've been in the trenches practicing law and trying cases and representing individuals and standing in the way of the government against citizens in this, in this country. I've been doing it a long time. And when I sit in the room with these policy makers and Department of Justice and people talking about the issues, they're the same issues I heard about 36 years ago. Really, underfunding of defenders, yeah. systemic racism, yeah. um, all of the issues that go to the heart of what's going on in the system, it's, it's the same stuff. So I say to myself, are we really going to go anywhere unless we join forces? So I appreciate Tina being, being here. It's the first time I've actually, I think I was on a panel at the ABA years ago, and I've been a member. Um, but it's nice to feel like I may have a platform that we can really do something together. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and I hope what I say, um, you take heart to some of the words. And look, I don't have all the answers. I mean, if I did, maybe I'd be the president of the United States. I don't know. <laughs> Who wants that job? So, um, but I don't have the answers, but I can um, message some things that I hope can happen. This morning, um, you know, the front page is that Sam Bankman Freed had, was found guilty of seven counts. I know a lot of defenders who are really applauding his conviction, saying the white guy, see, he needs to get convicted. It's fair. The system is getting more fair when you hold up folks like that to be convicted. And it was interesting, because I didn't have that same sense. I just didn't. My sense was, here's a young man who did a horrible crime. Billions of dollars is what he got convicted of. But he's 31 years old. When he engaged in the crime, he was a young, young man. I think he started at 21, 22. What we know as defenders, the frontal lobe doesn't fully develop until you're 27, 28. We argue that all the time in front of the court. 
and he's engaged in horrible activity. They say he's looking up to 100 years in prison. Why? What, what are we going to do with him for 100 years? What's the point and the purpose of that? What's the point and the purpose of imprisoning young men in Angola, Louisiana, for a bag of marijuana for the rest of their life because they have enhancements? What's the purpose on nonviolent felonies in this country and our hunger for overcriminalization of conduct? It's remarkable. And I think to myself, have we learned nothing in this country with mass incarceration? Have we learned nothing with the criminal bill that was passed by the Democrats? Have we learned nothing? Is fentanyl, is the scourge in this country, opiates? Absolutely. Is mass incarceration the answer? Post-Dobbs, we're now seeing conduct that has been constitutional being eroded and taken away from women and many individuals. In my opinion, the biggest constitutional challenge in this country is post-Dobbs. It's not a political issue. It's not a gender issue. It's not just about women. It's about the over-criminalization of conduct in this country. That's the moment that we stand on. So when we sit back and we clap for the conviction of this young man, when you sit back and you clap for this guy, Trump, that's being indicted all over the country, think about what does that mean in the long term for our clients, for the average citizen in this country? It's not popular. You gotta actually sit back and take your own biases away. But if you really wanna move forward, um, it's a moment to pause. Um, I have a little PowerPoint, so what, when I talk about we've come together, we've come together, the ABA, NAPD, and LADA, and ACDL, we're doing a lot of really great things on the front, we really are. One of the things that we've been doing together with the ABA is second chances, trial penalty, and the plea bargaining report, which is fantastic and everybody should read it. And, the, and federal independence. Second chances. It's a big movement in this country, finally, but why? <laughs> why do we finally think maybe we should take a look at sentences that occurred 25 years ago and say to ourselves, would that be the same sentence today? And should you get a second chance? Why do we even have to think about that? Because you know what? I'll be long gone, and they'll be talking about this with the fentanyl, and saying, well, let's look back on those fentanyl sentences that we handed down. We have a good moment in time. This is a picture of the Sentencing Commission, and it's been great. And, and Judge Reeves, Carlton Reeves, is the chief judge on the Sentencing Commission, the African-American man in the middle. I don't think they knew what they were getting when they got there. <laughs> <laughs> it's the real deal. And he cares. And he's not afraid to say it and to actually do things that matter. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and I don't really usually speak glowing of judges, even the ones I like. Because I feel like you're doing what you need to do. you got to do it. That's your job. But he's really, really done some incredible things for us. November 1st, two days ago, the new amendments took um, um, hold, which is fantastic, I think, because it will still take the judges to move these motions forward, right? Um, but now we at least have some tr traction to maybe do something. So... Um, it's a new criteria for federal lawyers in the federal system to reduce sentences 
under expanded family circumstances, inadequate medical care, assault by corrections officers. What we've learned, and we've joined forces with FAM and many of the lawyers from the ABA, is that women were being sexually assaulted in these federal prisons. We knew it, we've known it, we've heard it for years, but finally we have people who are caring about it. Karen Bass was one of the first people who got into the folds with us. I, I, was, I was in one of my first hearings when I took this job, and I said to her, I, I just went up to her and I said, will you come and partner and will you talk about this? And she cared. She really cared, and she went to FAM and Mary Price, who you all know, and they're doing something about it, that these women who are victims of sexual assault by the guards and have been for years, that there's a reason to release these women and look at their sentences. How hard is that? Everybody cares about victims of sexual assault, but I guess it's different when you're in prison. So we now have something to do something, and Dublin um, is a big, a big focus for a number of lawyers. And then there's a catch-all in terms of looking, the looking back. And it's gonna be interesting how the courts look at the looking back. But just in the last couple of months, I mean, you see this, and this is my office, and my, the wonderful lawyers, the staff attorneys that I have, that are partnering with ABA lawyers, doing this volunteer work, and saving people's lives, getting them out of BOP. And nothing is better, right, than saving a life. There's nothing better. And we're not talking about people who are innocent. I love the Innocence Project, Barry sitting here, he's one of my best friends. But I'm always looking at him and saying, but and not everybody's innocent, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so what about the rest of them, Barry? Because thank God, while I've been doing this, most of my clients weren't. I can truthfully say that. And I don't think I could have done it for 37 years if they were all innocent. I don't know who wants that burden on their back. But they're overcharged, absolutely. There are cases that shouldn't be charged. Wrong conduct that doesn't equate to criminal conduct. Lessers. They, all of those things were part of my practice. And so for those people, they deserve that second look, right? And so these folks, um, you know, someone dying of renal disease, they get out, I mean, you know, their care and their reentry is so, so sad. Just last week, um, Liz Budnitz, who's one of the staff attorneys in my office, there was a young man who was at the Boston bombing who saved a number of people. He was hurt very badly himself. As a result, he got hooked on opioids mm -hmm. from the pain of his injury. Got busted in a conspiracy and got a life sentence. Liz got him out a week and a half ago. He deserved a second chance, absolutely. Um, and so um, these are the folks that you were taking a look back at, and I know you all are in this. The trial penalty, and, and this goes along with the plea bargaining report. What we are now hearing about is forced pleas, and it's making us take a look at ourselves, frankly. Because we, as defenders, it's not just judges, I can't just blame it on prosecutors, we have been complicit in mass incarceration. And in this moment, we're finally talking about it. We're saying, okay, we can talk about it with each other, and how did this happen, and how can we stop it? The problem is, force pleas are going on around in this country, uh, I, I, I don't, I, probably 100 a day. I mean, it's just happening. And in this job, I've had the opportunity to travel places where there are no defender offices, where folks in this country, by and large, are represented by court-appointed lawyers. Indigent people are represented by court-appointed lawyers, not public defenders, not say CJA counsel, but court-appointed lawyers. And those lawyers are left out on their own by themselves with no support. Many of them are well-meaning folks. They want to do right by these people. But how do you try a murder on a flat fee of $1,500? How do you look for experts? How do you really take the time to do what you ought to do on $1,500 for the case? Period. End of story. You plead or you go to trial, it's $1,500. 
That's what's happening in this country, and it's happening all over the place. So you got the trial penalty, and what we know is this. In the federal system, 97% of cases plead. In the state system, it's a little bit better, because state lawyers are really going to trial. But because of mandatory minimum sentences, because of the harsh way, you know, you got judges who are literally telling um, defendants, if you go to trial and you get convicted, it's going to be worse for you. Well, that's not what the Constitution says. You have a right to go to trial. You have a right to challenge the government's evidence against you. But that's not what judges will tell you. And so it's scary. It's scary for the average citizen. And it's scary for the average young lawyer who's not equipped to stand up and really be able to take it. It, you know, I've been practicing 36 years. It's very different for me to go in a courtroom and look at a judge and go, okay, go ahead and tell my client that. We're going to trial because he's got me. But a young lawyer with no experience, who's afraid for the client, who's concerned that maybe they'll get convicted of the greater, they plead them out. It's called force pleas, and it happens all the time. Down in the South, and I'm actually listening to a podcast. Damn those podcasts, because it's made me a crime obsessed. I mean, I don't, I'm just like, I've got to listen to something happy. Um, but I, just, I don't know what's wrong with us, but there's a podcast called Blind Plea, and I'd never heard of a blind plea until I listened to, to the story of this woman down in Mississippi. I think it's Mississippi and Alabama. I'm sorry, I get them mixed up. Um, my parents are both from the South, so they would be not happy about that. But um, where you just plead straight up and fall on the mercy of the court. It's called a blind plea. It happens all day long. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? What are you advising your client? What are you telling them? I know the judge. I, I think this will happen. I have no legal basis, but you're going to go ahead and just plead with the blind plea. So we have been complicit. However, I know we are trying so hard to train lawyers around this country. Bonnie Hoffman, who is my um, staff attorney for public defense, is doing a tremendous job in this country. She just got back from Maine. She was in Maine at the time of the shooting, training public defenders. You think Maine, right? Oh, it's beautiful Bar Harbor. I don't know. What do you think about Maine? They don't have anything, any resources in Maine. It's incredible. I was shocked. Nothing. To get an expert is like asking the court, you know, for millions of dollars out of their own money, out of their own pocket. So Bonnie was down there during the shooting, and despite um, them being on lockdown, she continued to train those lawyers. And I know April's doing that in LIDA, NAPD. Um, Lori Towns is down in Montgomery right now at a racial justice conference. We're trying hard. We're trying hard. But it needs to, we need to have the money and the resources to do that, right? And Tina knows that. I mean, we, we talk about that. How do we get to everybody? Um, without using our own money, Tina, and just going poor, right? So, um, but the trial penalty um, is, a pro is a problem. So, and what we also know is that this unchecked government power in plea negotiations. I was in a jurisdiction in Colorado where um, the lawyers, the DAs, were so um, entitled about what they were doing was right. They would literally send letters, so it's in writing, before the preliminary hearing and, and put in a written form that if you go to preliminary hearing, some people, some people are not in yet, and you don't take this plea, here are the consequences of not taking this plea. Are you kidding me? You're not gonna even let me challenge probable cause and my client is gonna be somehow is going to some consequences, some harsher sentence. And why do you think that's okay and ethical? Because as you know, how many cases fall apart once you start litigating them? Hundreds.
hundreds of cases, right? I mean, one of the things that I was very proud of is when I was a defender, the government, whenever I came in the courtroom, they were like rolling their eyes and going, oh God, she's such a pain in the ass. You're right, I was a pain in the ass because I litigated everything. And I don't care if it had been litigated before, I was gonna litigate it right the next time, right? And so litigation is key to the erosion of what the government finds out in their own case. How many times is the government surprised by what you find for them? <laughs> right? That they didn't even know. So if you're not pushing and you're pleading clients out, what does that mean? Here's what the ABA, your criminal justice report says about the plea bargaining. Report is, conclusions, defendants are coerced into taking pleas, weak cases move forward, misconduct goes unchecked, racial disparities flourish, innocent defendants plead guilty, and civic engagement and oversight disappear. That's what you all found. So what does it mean? What do you do now that that's what's been found? You go out and you teach lawyers to litigate. You teach lawyers to stand up, and you teach lawyers to footnote this report in their motion of why they're doing what they're doing, right? Um, the AD ABA adopted the 14 principles from the Plea Bargain Task Force report as the policy just in August 2023. You ought to be out there singing it loud and clear and letting everybody know what you did. I am. NACDL's doing that because what you did was right. And thank you. Because I know it's hard to move stuff in the ABA. I see all that democracy. <laughs> so now we're at a crucial time for defender independence, right? Um, and it's, it's it, uh, federal defenders are, are nervous as heck right now. Um, but the ABA published again another report about why independence is important. I think you already all know that. I've been part of these reports, I feel like, for a long time with a lot of you, right? Cynthia's nodding around. I see Ellen Podmore back there. I mean, we've been part of this Cardone report and, and the Prado report. I remember these, and we all felt really strongly that we needed to show why independence mattered to the federal bench. And now we got the new report. And the new report basically says, guess what, nothing's changed. <laughs> it took a long time, a lot of people, to put that report together, and really well-intentioned folks. But nothing's really changed. And we know that because um, of what's going on right now, because they literally, during this budget crisis, said that, um, that, that the federal defenders are prohibited from advocating for their own funding, and that caused the budget error that they're dealing with now. That's what happened. So what are they gonna do? They gotta have control over their own budget. Defenders know what needs to be done. Defenders know what it takes to try a case. In the Northern District of um, California, just two days ago, one of my wonderful colleagues and past presidents of this of NACDL won a huge, huge white collar case, and that's Drew Finley, along with the federal defender. Her name is Jamie Falk, and she's a fantastic defender. And together, a paid retained lawyer and a federal defender, I mean, they kicked butt on a case where people thought they could not win. In the beginning of that case, there were real issues about funding for the federal defender, and I don't want to tell too many secrets, but the bottom line is you, got a, a, you have people in many of these districts who are the CJA folks who supposedly overlook funding and say what we can have and what the federal defender should be doing, and they're not the defenders. And so they look at these cases and they go, well, Judge, I think this should probably only take 20 hours and the person should probably only file two motions. Like two plus two equals four. This is people's lives. You're going to put it in some formula and tell me this is how much I should charge and this is how much I should do? Do you think these big firms, that's how they bring in cases on their, on their retainers? Absolutely not. Point one, cost in a big law firm. 
And it should cost, because it's your work. And so when they talk about this budgeting crisis, it's a real problem, and it's not over yet. So the ABA, and a number of the lawyers signed on, um, Kyle O'Dowd, who is my deputy in policy, walk and just incredible and has been on the Hill for 20 years, we put together an incredible letter and we've been at Congress trying to help the defenders make sure. And I think it was, um, and it was an op-ed piece yesterday by Jamie, what's her name that wrote the Great Independence Report? You know Barry. Um, she did a great report talking about you all got to do something because the budget is stuck. It hasn't passed. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what passes. Well, I did see they passed something this morning. What was $159 billion? So Bill, yeah, okay, really? So you're gonna cut that. Did you see they were there till midnight last night because they wanna cut the budget of the Interior Secretary, some, somebody else, the National, to a dollar. That's what they argued about until one o'clock last night. Five o'clock nine, really? So we're going to get to the budget cut, budget cuts for defenders who are defending most of these cases in federal court. They want to cut. They want to cut it. They want a hiring freeze. So they want to bring more cases because they are, but they don't want to give the defender the resources to defend those cases. We got to stand behind them. Um, so ninety percent of the people that are that are. Um, that are charged are, you know, with the defender's office, and we got to, if, if DOJ is going to continue on this path of filing and indicting everybody, then we got to have the resources to be able to defend the average citizen. What I want to go and scream in that house is, do you know that it's the defenders who are defending those insurrectionists, your people, that were the ones standing in the trenches to make sure the government is overreaching? That's what I want to tell them. I mean, come on. Um, but you know, it's just this vision of it must not really be like that. So I know. I, I, I get so I get so angry. Is anybody else angry? I don't want to be angry. Okay, but I, you know what? I don't want to be an angry person. But I feel like I go to bed and I do yoga. I go to bed and, I, um, and I'm still mad when I wake up. So. Um, but I think that. <laughs> I think there is um, some path forward, and like I said, um, I don't have all the answers, but I think this is an, this really is a moment to assess our direction. I'm not like everybody about getting more money. I really am not. I really feel like it's time for, instead of DOJ telling us where we should be as defenders, telling us how we should do it, it ought to be us at a table together, looking at each other and saying, how does this look 10, 20, 30 years from now? Mm -hmm. I know a political party that did that. They had a plan. We need a Marshall Plan. I think that's what Barry's always talking about, but it's, we do. We need a Marshall Plan. We need something that truly can fix this ongoing problem. And I really do believe there is a solution. But I'll tell you where I say pause. Because when they want to throw money at us to fix everything, I say, wait a minute. The criminal legal system is not the safety net for mental health illness in this country. We are not here to have to fix the mental health problem, which is a tremendous problem in this country. I didn't go to law school to do that. Look, I believe in holistic defense. I believe in caring about my client and visiting my client and knowing who my client is. But I became a lawyer because I believed in legal issues and fighting against the government. That's why I became a lawyer. And so we are diluting our power by saying, give us more money to fix a system that you all need to fix. Because frankly, mentally ill people shouldn't be in the criminal legal system in the first place, right? So you can't wait, you cannot wait for them to be criminalized and suddenly look at defenders and say, you fix it for us now. I don't believe in that. So I think we've got to pause and say, how big do we want to get? How far do 
we want to go with this. We're compassionate, empathetic people that truly care about the homeless man you pass on the street when you come up to the hotel. Every time I see him, it doesn't change how I feel about his life and where he's going and where he must have come from. That's who we are. But do I think that the criminal legal system ought to be the safety net for him? Absolutely not. And I think it's time for us to take a moment and think about that. I think it's a mo time to, talk, to take a moment about, and think about the way that we are going to go forward in terms of um, this over-criminalization and our politicizing these cases. I really, you know, one of the things that causes me great hurt to my heart is that when I hear defenders saying, I can't do that kind of case. I don't know. I mean, I know people are woke and I'm older and my son tells me I'm a product of a patriarchy society. And I go, that's right, I am. I'm not going to deny those, are, those, are true. those things are true. And you all have heard that from your kids. But you know what? So true. I believe in the Constitution. We're the only people, we're the only lawyers, defenders, are, are the only ones mentioned in the Constitution. The Sixth Amendment, that's what we're about. So it is this moment that I'm so very happy that you called on me because I believe we, the criminal justice warriors who have been in this space for a very long time, will get it done. Thank you, Tina.